Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Miss Irene Dunn in Harnett T. Kane's Bride of Fortune on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we present a novel called Bride of Fortune by Harnett T. Kane. The Bride of Fortune Mr. Kane writes of became the wife of an American whose name is in every history book, Jefferson Davis, President of the Confederate States during those tragic years which only a very few people still alive can actually remember. Those of us who nowadays read about them can form our own opinion of the issues, and I dare say most of us have. But enough time has passed for all of us to read with understanding the story of a man whose personal character won for him the affection and loyalty of a charming and devoted woman. This is the story of Bride of Fortune which we tell tonight. And we are happy indeed to have with us in the starring role one of Hollywood's most distinguished actresses, Miss Irene Dunn. And now, a word about Hallmark cards from Frank Goss before we begin the first act of Bride of Fortune. At Christmas, as on every memorable occasion, you'll take special pride in sending Hallmark cards. Because just as for hundreds of years the word Hallmark has been the distinguishing symbol of quality, so today the Hallmark on the back of your greeting cards is your assurance of finest quality and perfect taste. It's a symbol of quality all who receive your cards will quickly recognize and realize you cared enough to send the very best. Now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Harnett T. Kane's Bride of Fortune, starring Miss Irene Dunn. The carriage went slowly through the streets of Richmond. I sat beside my husband riding through the spring afternoon as we had ridden together so many times in the days long past. And as I rode, I found myself thinking, God heals all wounds. Already the grass grows green across the land, masking the soil where the steel went deep and the blood deeper. Already the lark and the sparrow, the grasshopper and the bee have taken repossession of the air that only recently shivered to the blast of gun and cannon. Already hands once clenched in male fists have reached out to one another in returning friendship. God heal all wounds. And then I looked at the weary, hopeless face of my husband beside me, and I, I thought, but how of your wounds? How of yours? And I touched his hand, and he turned towards me and smiled. You're very quiet, Marina. Jeff, I love you. I love you. He turned towards me and he smiled and suddenly the years fell away from both of us. And no longer was it May in Richmond. It was Christmas in Vicksburg and I was 17 and Jeff was in his early 30s. I was visiting his brother Joe's family for the holidays. And on Christmas Eve, we stood alone on the veranda. I remember every word he said. I, I've been married, you know. My wife died. It was some years ago. I know. Uh, there, there's a man in Natchez, I... Uh, well, there's a sort of an understanding. Our family... I'll probably stay right here and be a farmer, a cotton grower, the rest of my life. It isn't the most exciting life for a woman, but it's all right for a man. But what about the political start you've made in these campaigns? I don't know that I'm fitted for politics. Well, you've showed already what you can do. All, all you ever have to do is tell the people what you think and let them decide. And furthermore... Plenty of women have found life very exciting and full and happy as wives of farmers. Do you think you'd be happy as a farmer's wife? 
Oh, Jeff, I, I think I'd be happy as yours. Farina. Oh, Farina. <gasps> I'm sure I'd be happy as yours. But listen, it's Christmas. Merry Christmas, darling. Merry Christmas, darling. Yes, the carriage went slowly through the streets of Richmond. And my husband turned towards me and he smiled. And then he reached out and took my hand. My hand fitted his in the old glove-like way, and my heart was with its own. It lifted inside me just the way it lifted the day Jeff took me to Briarfield as his wife. It was spring at Briarfield. Jeff lifted me out of the carriage, and, and he said to me, This has been my kingdom, and now it's yours. And so I entered my kingdom. My kingdom's carpet was the rich green land, and my kingdom's walls was far-flung horizon. The ceiling of my kingdom was blue and gold by day and star-crested at night, and when I walked across it, the winds rested across my shoulders like silken scarves, and the voices of the river and the insect and the bird blended to a symphony. The treasure of my kingdom was in lavish display everywhere. Goldenrod waist high, lily pads the size of platters, and cotton lifting a regal fleecy head. That was my kingdom. Land and sky and horizon and my husband's arms. Are you happy, Verena? Happy? Oh, Jeff, there never was such happiness on earth before. I, I just wish we could never leave here. Perhaps we don't have to. Oh, no, no. A man like you can't live apart from the world, Jeff. Oh, James Pemberton was up to the house today. What a fine man he is. Yes, when I'm not here, he's in complete charge of Briarfield. It's unusual, I know, not to have a white overseer, but there isn't a better, most more competent man anywhere than James Pemberton. Well, everything certainly appears to be in beautiful order. I've always insisted that the Negroes get good treatment. Whenever there's anything wrong, I like to have them settle it themselves. I've shown them how to set up a jury and hold a trial with their own people as judges. I'm glad you like Pemberton. He's one of my best friends in the whole world. You know, he was given to me as a body servant after I graduated from West Point. We moved together into free territory, and James could have freed himself any time he desired, but he preferred to stay with me. He saved my life more than once during those army days. Jeff, my grandmother always said that the founders of this country only allowed slavery in the first place because all sorts of compromises had to be made to get the government started. But she said they, they all expected it to die out. You believe that, Jeff? Yes. It'll end slowly, though. It'll take a lot of time and preparation. Well, why don't we teach our people to read and write? My people have been learning to care for themselves through experience. If a man returns to me the value of a day's work, he can take the time for himself. Last year, one of my men earned a couple of thousand dollars for himself running a small store. Well, that's wonderful. Every family here can keep garden plots and sell to me or anybody else on the river. Marina, progress must be made slowly and with infinite care. I believe that if you try to rush things too fast, you only breed disaster. Come in. Mr. Jeff, I'm sorry to disturb you but I wondered if I could go over some figures with you. Come in, James. Sit down. James, I was going over my will last night. I suppose you'll want your freedom if I die before you do. Well, sir, if you pass away, I'd want to stay on and take care of Ms. Davis. Oh, James, thank you. But if, if anything happened to Ms. Davis, I'd want to be free. And that's how it'll be, James. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, sir. I look back to those years now, and it's hard to say when the cloud first appeared on the horizon and what the actual events were that darkened and spread until it reached the north and south. Jeff was a vital man, intensely interested in his country's problems. I waited at home while he went out on political campaigns and on speaking tours. 
I waited and prayed for a safe return during the fearful, agonized days of the Mexican War. When at last he did come back, he was appointed to the Senate. We went to Washington. And there, our first child died of the fever and was buried. Later, Jeff served as Secretary of the War under President Pierce, and when Pierce's term was over, Jeff re-entered the Senate again. I wrote letters for him, took down his speeches when he dictated them, lived for him, worshipped him. I remember once how he stopped our carriage in front of the White House, gazed up at it. I remember the pride in his face as he looked. See that building, Verena? That's the heart of the whole United States. The blood of the North, the South, the East, and the West is joined together there in one man. That building represents unity and strength. The unity and strength of the United States of America. It's exciting, isn't it, Jeff? Here in this city, you, you have your fingers to the pulse of the entire nation. See that flag? Looks mighty sweet up there, doesn't it? Mm. You know when it looks even sweeter? When? When you followed it into battle, as I have. And you see it at the close of the day, still high in the air, triumphant. <laughs> I remember my husband's face as he looked at the stars and stripes of the United States of America. And I remember his face another day. Another day, dark, discordant, when I sat beside the rail in the Senate for the last time and heard him speak from the floor. Gentlemen of the Senate, my state has seceded. To maintain our rights, we must leave. My state's convinced that her constitutional rights will not be honored. Her safety requires that she provide elsewhere for their maintenance. This action is the same action that the American revolutionists took when they withdrew from a government that threatened destruction of their rights. I, I see around me men with whom I've long served. In some cases, there have been differences between us. If I've unwittingly injured any of you, I offer my apologies. It only remains for me to bid you a final farewell. Here I am, Jeff. I came down so I could leave the building with you. There's the White House, the flag. Jeff. It isn't our flag anymore. Jeff, when you were fighting in the Mexican War, I'd stop sometimes and I'd look at that flag and I'd think, he's risking his life. But it's worth it, the loneliness and the waiting and even the risk as long as you're still up there above our heads. I felt the same way all through the nights that I prayed that my father would return during the War of 1812. Jeff, I'm sorry. My head's going round in circles. My heart. Oh, Jeff. I think my heart is broken. Here. Get in the carriage, dear. My child is dead and sleeps within this city. I'll have to leave him here, alone, among enemies. Oh, Jeff. Why couldn't they have settled it peacefully? Go back in there. Talk to them. Find the way. There must be a way. Marina, they want me to be, to be provisional president of the Confederate States. President of the Confederacy? Yes, Marina, president of the Confederacy. It's the last position in the world I want, but how can I refuse? Well, then, we, we must hurry. We have much to do. You're my wife. You will not fail me. No, Jeff, I'll not fail you. But may God guide us and help us to find our way out of this darkness. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Bride of Fortune, starring Miss Irene Dunn. 
Do you know about the wide and wonderful selection of Hallmark Christmas cards in boxes of 25 cards each, all alike? It's a new and very convenient way to buy your Hallmark cards. For a small additional charge, many stores will imprint your name, or you may prefer to sign them personally. There's excitement in opening a box that has Hallmark on the cover. You find such unusual cards inside. Here's one that shows dear old Santa asleep with an expression on his face that reminds you of all the love and tenderness that fill the world on Christmas night. Twenty-five of these cards in a box cost just one dollar. And here's a card that would be perfect for a couple to send. Mr. and Mrs. Snowman with a lighted lantern, so charming they bring you the friendliness and bright cheer of Christmas. And there are other delightful boxes of Hallmark Christmas cards from $1 to $3 for 25 cards at the friendly store where you buy Hallmark cards. Look for Hallmark on the cover of the box to be sure your cards have that Hallmark on the back. It's a symbol of quality that all who receive your cards will quickly recognize, and they'll know you cared enough to send the very best. And now here is the second act of Bride of Fortune, starring Miss Irene Dunn. <laughs> went slowly through the streets of Richmond. I looked at my husband and thought of time and times passing and what it had meant to us. I thought of the children that had been born to us and lived to bless our union. I thought of happiness. I thought of grief. I thought of terror. I sat beside my husband riding through the streets of Richmond and I remembered music. <laughs> I remembered music and the shrill whine of bullets and the roar of cannon. And what does a woman remember of war? I remember that the soldiers were young and it seemed that they had a shining gallantry as they marched. Or was that because my tears shone between us as I watched them? I remember how death came and stood beside me as I read each casualty report and how in the night the cold finger of fear would touch my heart and rouse me to walk the sleepless hours. I remember stopping my carriage to help a wounded soldier and the look of his life's blood on the green silk dress I was wearing. I remember glimpsing my husband through a half-open door, down on his knees, praying. And I remember dropping to my own knees and thinking... The northern men and women pray together, too. Dear God, help us to find our way back to one another. I remember the slow-moving wagons piled high with furniture moving out of Richmond and the long files of sad-faced men and women. I remember the harsh lines of hunger in those faces and the hopelessness of their shoulders. I remember how as the war reports came in, adoration gradually chilled to cold hatred in the looks they turned on Jeff. And I remember how I gave birth to a child with the sound of distant cannon throbbing through my veins. What does a woman remember of war? I remember my husband's face, older each time I saw him, and at last, old. I remember the tragic finality of the word, Gettysburg. And joining with my children the stream of people fleeing south, and I remember Jeff riding up and joining us one night when we had pitched our tent. I was alone in mine when he walked in. Verena, oh, my sweet, my love, Verena, thank God you and the children oh, are Jeff, safe. I'm so happy to see you, but you shouldn't be here if the federal troops capture they you. They capture me. At least I'll have seen you once again. Jeff, I've seen the posters. President Johnson has offered $100,000 reward for your capture. Yes, they're claiming I helped plot the assassination of Lincoln. Dare they say a thing like that? Marina, there's something I want you to tell our children. I may be captured. I may not be able to say this for myself. Tell them when they're old enough to understand that they'll hear many things said of me and of the men who fought beside me. But this, their father wanted them to know. We were not traitors. We fought honestly and bravely for what we believed in. Right or wrong, we fought in defense of our own principles. We lost, but we lost with honor. You're speaking as though... You your own life were over. To the victor belongs the spoils. Since I don't come under the former category, I must come under the latter. I 
I remember standing with our children in a cold gray dawn. I remember the soldiers lined up behind Jeff and the tug waiting at the wharf to take him from us. His face was gaunt as he embraced us and a raw, discouraged wind sighed disconsolately about us. <laughs> Mother, don't let him take Papa. Don't let him take him. Please don't let him take don't, him. Don't, don't, son, don't let him see you cry. Your sister and brother aren't crying. Oh, Jim. <laughs> I love you all. I'll always love you. Come, Mr. Davis. Goodbye. God keep you. <laughs> So began two years of worry, of prayer, of striving in every way I could devise to get my husband set free, or at least brought to trial so he could answer the charges brought against him. Most of the people in the South seemed to hate him. At times, I seemed to be fighting completely alone. I wrote letters. I gathered information in Jeff's defense. I hired attorneys. Mrs. Davis. I have written repeatedly to the authorities, as you know about Mr. Davis. All the satisfaction I've been able to get is that the case is under advisement. But they can't hold him on the basis that he was involved in the assassination any longer. The men who testified that he was have admitted they lied. That's public knowledge. Mrs. Davis, I have one suggestion for you. What is that? Go north for help. Go north? If men like Horace Greeley would step behind you, I think you could get your husband freed. Greeley is one of the most powerful newspaper men in the country. But Greeley was Jeff's enemy. How could I go to him? Greeley is a champion of justice, Mrs. Davis. It's worth a try. Mr. Greeley, I'm very grateful to you for consenting to see me. Sit down, Mrs. Davis. Now, tell me about your husband. I saw him in prison a few weeks ago. He sits there day after day, night after night, in, in a small damp cell just waiting. The people who once loved him seem to have forsaken him. Those who swore to remember have long since forgotten. Why is he being held? Is he alone to be held responsible for the war? No. That cannot be. It must not be. No one man was responsible for the war. This war was like a quarrel in a family in which brothers in a flare of anger lose their tempers and exchange blows. And now the quarrel is over and the brothers are at peace and the family is together again. Bitterness must be put aside. Anger must be forgotten. The family is the important thing. It must go on. How can I serve you, Mrs. Davis? I have an application for his release. I've been getting signatures of northern men. May I see the list? Of course. Mm -hmm. Here is the testimony of exactly what I've been saying, Mrs. Davis. You have here the signatures of men who were among the most bitter opponents of slavery. Here, written by their own hands, are the names of Jefferson Davis's enemies asking that he be set free. I shall be honored to add my own name to that list. And so at last, two years after Jeff had been in prison in Fortress Monroe, we rode together through the streets of Richmond. And now he was free, and I looked up at him, and the tears burned my eyes, and he smiled at me in the old remembered way. There's a hotel down the street. Jeff, look at those people in front of us. It's a mob. Oh, Jeff, Jeff, let's turn the carriage around and go in the hotel the back way. I don't think I can bear it if... if... These are my people, Verena. Whatever they have to say to me, I must hear. But these people are bitter. You don't realize, Jeff. I don't want you hurt anymore. You've been hurt enough. They're my people. Whatever they have to say, I must hear, Verena. Over there. So still and not making a sound, Jeff. Come, Verena. Let me help you out of the carriage. Yes, of course, my dear. Hats off, Virginians! Hats off for Jeff Davis! Hats off! Hats off! Hundreds of 
of men stood bareheaded facing us, and arm in arm with their welcome roaring in our ears, we walked between them, and the tears ran down my face unheeded. We were home. The long war of grief and pain was over. The flag of stars and stripes was our flag, and once more we were a United States of America, and I found myself praying. Thank God for teaching us the meaning of the word united. Thank God that the family's together again and that there's peace between the brothers. Hilton will return in a moment. How would you like a foremost artist to paint your Christmas cards this Christmas? Then look through the Hallmark Gallery Artist Album. It's like having the paintings of a renowned art gallery pass before your eyes. And another exciting Hallmark album is the Blue Book. Here's the sophisticated snowman in top hat with his lady, both so bewitching they'll charm you into smiling back at them. And here's the merriest card of Santa in his sleigh. It opens cleverly to surprise you with a long line of tiny reindeer prancing and dancing. Here, completely different, is a card of beautiful simplicity. All lovely green with one tall candle aflame, symbol of Christmas. Tomorrow, go to the friendly store where you buy Hallmark cards and ask to see Hallmark albums. Look for the Hallmark on the cover of the album you select from to be sure your cards have that Hallmark on the back. It's a symbol of quality that all who receive your cards will quickly recognize, and they will know you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. Thank you, Irene Dunn, for a wonderful performance and for giving us the portrait of a great woman. Thank you, Mr. Hilton, and thank you, John McIntyre, for your performance as Jeff. I really enjoyed playing Verena Davis, and of course, it's a pleasure to return to the Hallmark Playhouse. You know, we're old friends. Hallmark cards and I. And speaking for Hallmark, may I say we feel that also, Miss Dunn. And may I interrupt Mr. Hilton to remind you, Miss Dunn, that it's not too early to have made your selection of your Hallmark cards for this Christmas. Well, thank you, Frank, for your reminder. That's the first thing on my shopping list tomorrow. And before you go, Miss Dunn, our appreciation again for a grand performance. We do hope you'll come back soon. Meanwhile, I hope you'll be listening next week when we have that fine actor Lou Ayers appearing in A Letter to Mr. Priest by Margaret Cousins which is the story of how a young man worked hard to become a good country lawyer. And the following week on Thanksgiving Day, what could be more appropriate than the courtship of Miles Standish? Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our director-producer is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. And our script tonight was adapted by Gene Holloway. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. <laughs> Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores and have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at this same time when James Hilton returns to present Lou Ayers in Margaret Cousins' A Letter to Mr. Priest and the week following Thanksgiving Day, The Courtship of Miles Standish starring David Niven and the week after that, Miss Bishop by Best Streeter Aldrich on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is PMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.